here live at the Fluent Conference. This is uh, Silicon Angles, The Cube, our flagship program of Gotham Advanced Constructed Suddenly from the Noise. And O'Reilly Media is really putting on a great event here for developers, really looking for the next big thing, how to take JavaScript, take it to the next level, full stack, protocol standards, community new tooling, a lot of amazing stuff. So if you're a developer out there, watch the feed and connect with this community. It's a great event. Uh, I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined with Jeff Frick from Silicon Angle. And we're co-hosting here at the Fluent Conference. We're here at Brandon Satram, who's uh, program manager for lead cross-platform tools and services. Uh, Telerik, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you very much, thanks for having me. Uh, so, uh, obviously, you know, JavaScript um, is very rel relevant. It's not going anywhere. Uh, right. It's going, going to the moon and back, as I say to my kids, you know, and it's, it's really big. But there's baggage with JavaScript, and there's opportunities with JavaScript. So, you know, it's been around for a while. There's all kinds of, you know, issues. Developers know firsthand pain points around you know, multiple browsers. Sure, <laughs> and, sure. you know, things are going to, are moving very, very fast, and it's really scaling from just, you know, scripting to full stack protocol support. Obviously, REST APIs are amazing. Right. At Advent to accelerate that. But it's just, it's, devol it's evolving really fast into a whole nother dimension. Absolutely. So, First comment I want to get from you is, is your view on that. I mean, the view of the Fluent Conference for the developers that aren't here, what's some of the conversations, and how do you see JavaScript and other technologies evolving, and, mm. and some of the dynamics around that? Well, you know, the beauty of a conference like this is it, it's proof of the ubiquity of this platform. I and mean, ubiquity is has always been a key word for me for web development because it is, it's, it's the only platform that all you really need to get in and get going is a text editor and a browser. You've got everything you need to know to start coding for this platform, even if it's just inside the desktop. And a lot of people get their start because of how easy it is to get into this world, into this platform, into the front end. And uh, seeing the level of excitement and activity, talking to people about what they're working on, uh, you know, great improvements in front-end development tooling, in the kinds of libraries that people are building, uh, based on JavaScript, the kind of tools that people are working on. It's just really exciting stuff, being on the Expo Hall and seeing what some of the other sponsors are doing and the things that they're talking about. Uh, it's been exciting to see, um, not just that, that people have continued to flock to this platform, but that it is, it is standing the test of time and continues to be the place where people go, by and large, to, to build their businesses, to, uh, to have a product, to form communities. It's just, it, it's, the web has continued to be. I, mean, I mean, it's easy to work with. I mean, that's one of the, one of the yeah. attributes of JavaScript was easy to work. Yeah, put the browser stuff aside, it's the pain in the butt, Internet Explorer, we all know the right. issues there. Right. Um, but Chrome and Google's here, and they're talking about some of the things that they're doing. It's really evolving into a you know, solid software engineering environment where developers are, are cutting their teeth into some new things. So, Absolutely. you know, there are some tooling issues, there are some new things coming out. What are you seeing? What are some of the conversations like here in the keynotes in the hallways. Yeah, I think I think tooling is one of those things that's very interesting. I'm seeing a lot of people uh, very interested in, uh, you know, they they're on this platform. A lot of them are, are are making the move to mobile because it's the undeniable place to be right now. Even on the web, you either are building hybrid apps or you're building native apps, but you're paying attention to that mobile landscape. Uh, and in in mobile specifically, the two biggest things that people talk about at this conference anywhere that I go is is the tooling story. Uh, but also the performance story. And those kind of go hand in hand because you can build tooling for better performance. Uh, but you can also, a lot of developers just want, uh, they want those bootstraps. They want uh, easy starter projects. They want good tools that help them get to get running, to hit the ground running, to target as many devices as possible. And they're really looking for options, but they're also looking for opportunities to uh, be a part of communities and contribute to communities as well. And so I'm seeing a lot of that, that kind of conversation in the hallways and in sessions as well. So Brandon, talk a little bit about, before you came on there, we were talking about the nightmare of some people that are still standardized on IE5, and uh, you know, that's a <laughs> uh -huh, difficult uh -huh. thing to develop yeah, for. Yeah. But now with mobile and the multiple platforms, and then you know, you got the standardized thing on iOS, but then I've got the, the explosion of Android, and now the, the, the Netscape phone, and, and uh, you know, all this interesting stuff. Is it getting harder or easier? And, and how is mobile changing your development paradigm, not so much for writing your first application, but for QA and test and rollout and upgrades and updates yeah, and all that type yeah. of thing. I mean, it seems like there's an explosion a of, uh, of, of quote unquote web platforms, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, with a lot of with a lot of companies, if they make the decision to go mobile, their first choice is 
you know, do we have the time and resources and teams to go native on all of those? And if they make the choice to go native, they're talking about having a development team for iOS, a development team for Android, a development team for Windows Phone, BlackBerry, and but there's even more now. There's Firefox OS, there's Tizen, there's Vada. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You reassign yeah. those guys. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that and that continues to propagate. And, you right, know, more right. platforms mean more issues on the native side, but even on the mobile side, uh, you then have the issue of, okay, so we're not going to go native. Let's go ahead and just target the mobile web, or let's build a hybrid app. You tend to have similar issues because now you're dealing with, you know, maybe cross-browser consistencies between inconsistencies between what uh, Safari on iOS gives you versus the stock Android browser on an Android 2X device versus Chrome for Android on an Android 4 device. And so this is, I think, where tooling comes back in and makes some plays because a lot of a lot of developers, when they make that choice to go hybrid, what they're saying is time to market matters to us. The ability to get the broadest reach to get in as, the hands of as many people as possible with our product or with our app really, really matters. Uh, and we want to use web technologies to do so because we have the skills to do that. And so when they're faced with, they make that choice, and yet now they have to deal with these cross-browser inconsistencies, it's kind of like the way web development was in the mid-90s. Right, it's, right. There's still a couple guys on IE5. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And I've been, and <laughs> I've been is, to, I've been to cities right? where I've asked that question of who's supporting, you know, what version of right, IE, and right. what hands come up for IE5 and IE5.5. Things like that. <laughs> Brandon, I, I want to ask you about some of the things that we've heard in the hallways, and Jeff and I were talking prior to coming on um, about some of the challenges around DevOps, and then we've got the physical internet of things, the mm -hmm. industrial internet. We had uh, Brady Forrest on yesterday. He's got a whole investment thesis around the software uh -huh. for devices, whether it's Nest, like a thermostat, or other cool things. And obviously, he's involved in Maker Fair, so you yeah. know, he's got a great job. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's always the trade-off between creativity for a developer and efficiency of coding. And you hear that all the time. Like, hey, I, want, I, I wrote such great code, but I wasn't very creative or I'm really creative, didn't write great code. Mm. So you just mentioned Bootstrap. So how do you see that uh, that challenge evolving? Because JavaScript is easy. There's some toolings that you can do available out there. So uh, how do you see that in the developer community here at Fluent, this community, around that balance of creativity versus efficient coding? Is it more advent of more open source? Is it more uh, modules? new products, how do you see that evolving? Because that's important to balance that. Absolutely, and I think as the community, and I've been been in the web community as a developer and in other roles for the past 15 years, and what I've seen over that time is a lot of broad maturity and growth in the way that we not only treat JavaScript as the language of the web, but the way that we handle our own practices and our own uh, disciplines around testing, around creating modular code, around uh, evaluating libraries and, and you know, bringing up libraries like, you know, libraries like Backbone and Knockout and MVVM and MVC libraries and things like this that allow developers an easy entree into the platform, but it also gives them some of that boilerplate so that they're really focusing on building a value. You know, they're not doing all the boilerplate, all of the, the repetitive task that they, you have to do from one app to the next, right, so that they're right. really just focused on what's the value in the app that I'm building. And I'm seeing as more and more people come into the community, more and more people say, I want to automate this repetitive task. I want to build a library that allows a developer to do this, to, uh, to to jump in quickly and to focus on delivering value instead of focusing on the same boilerplate every single time. And I think that's one of the biggest things is eliminating boilerplate, being very ruthless about testing and about uh, raising the bar for, for discipline. Um, I've seen that a lot in the JavaScript world. And I think one of the reasons why that's that's been so popular over the last couple of years is because you have people from a lot of other communities coming into the front end world. You have former Ruby developers, former .NET developers, or even current you know, people in these communities. But as they're turning their focus and attention more to the front end, they're bringing the practices and disciplines from those worlds, from those stacks, and applying those to the code that they're writing on the front end as well, not just in desktop apps, but in mobile. Hybrid what are the top well. uh, environments you're seeing here that's getting a lot more lift with the this new era of you know more server side, more real time streaming has been a big thing. We didn't you know one of the complaints is you're not hearing a lot about web sockets, but mm. you know managing things like that. All this new headroom is around the developer community. Yeah. Obviously, you got .NET. You mentioned Ruby. Any other environments? Uh, a lot of folks at Java, PHP as well. I mean, those are always really popular communities that as they um, you know continue, even as those communities continue to mature more and more people are realizing how much is possible on the front end. You know, how much how much you can deliver great performance in the browser with an app that doesn't post back to the server every time a user clicks a button, yeah. clicks a link. And so all of those communities are, are, are really 
uh, in droves coming into the front end and adopting it. You know, I've been I've been, uh, been in the web space, got, got going back to the original web 1.0 in the, in the 90s, and, and it's funny how JavaScript would hit the scene, it was really explosive because it was just so easy to work mm -hmm. with, and the demand for web apps and websites, et cetera, was evolving, rich media, all that good stuff. Um, but it became to a point where there was some kind of dilution to the brand and of the developers that were building JavaScript, and the old joke was, go to the yellow pages if you can get a web developer, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. and oh, I know JavaScript, I studied it in school, right. I banged right. out a, you know, a couple pictures pixels on one right. browser. So, right, right. you know, there's been, you know, it's not negative, it's just kind of the, the market lift. There's just been overall developers. So there's, you have kind of like pockets of, of IQ, I call it. And so you're seeing here the evolution of real software development, because you mentioned QA. You know, what, where is this going in terms of, of, of growth around the profile of developers? Obviously, you know, more stacks, different stacks, more mm -hmm. tooling, you got API has been a, a godsend for, for developers in the sense of, and with DevOps, et cetera, with cloud. So, mm -hmm. so, so uh, you know, Share with us your perspective of how it's evolved from, you know, kitty scripters to now real time, real, real chops. You I, know, I've, I've, I lived that, and yeah. that's what. That's There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's oh, yeah, you know, yeah, you, hey, bang out some websites, people got started, but the, the addiction of development, really software engineering practices, being more agile, being more QA. Can mm -hmm. you share some color? It, 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 that's an amazing trend that I've observed a lot, and I've given, I've talked about this in other other talks before. The way that the web has evolved, and the way that developers have come along for the ride and our perception of JavaScript a result over the last 15, over the last 17 years now, the language is 17 years old, that we have, uh, w when things first started, and I first started doing development, I was doing ASP Classic development, uh, using Microsoft ASP3 and SQL Server and simple websites for a consulting company based in Houston, and JavaScript was, it was about writing as little JavaScript as possible to get to the back end, right? To get to the server side code, because that's where the real development took yeah, place. Yeah. And you had, your stack was very little client, very large server, and, and database, right? And then what happened around the Web 2.0 time, when Jesse James Garrett coined the term Ajax, what he was observing was that the client was growing and the server was shrinking a little bit. And we started to see, people realized, hey, this is all this Ajax stuff is exciting. Oh, and I, I have to use JavaScript to do it. So maybe this isn't such a bad language after all. And people at that point started adopting uh, frameworks like jQuery and Dojo in in droves in dealing with some of those cross-browser inconsistencies and recognizing that really the issue that we had with JavaScript many years ago was never the language itself by and large, but was really the way that the DOM was implemented in one browser and implemented differently in another browser. And those pain points caused us to really deride the language and it wasn't fair. And so we, we learned during that time that with the with the increased power and responsibility that you had that you could do some really exciting things. And and what we've seen over the last ten years, or last seven or eight years from the web two point you know, the declaration of that movement yeah. now <laughs> is that the client has continued to grow, the server has continued to shrink. And now And IO is more important now. And right? IO is much more important now and you see uh, and JavaScript now has made the leap from the client to the server with Node, and he's in, and in a lot of cases has made the leap into into the database with databases like MongoDB, which effectively use JavaScript object notation as your query language into the database itself. So now you have this you have this world where JavaScript this this not that recently it's derided infiltrated. language it's is in on the entire <laughs> stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is on the entire and stack. that's an important trend to point out. I mean, this, yeah. the infiltration, as I call it, is really just growth. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. with Node, I think what you know, when we had the Node Summit two years ago, the first Node Summit in San Francisco, we did the Cube there. Um, we talked to a lot of the guys from Node Jitsu and mm -hmm. other, and they said, hey, you know what? People want to write mobile apps, and they need to talk to the server mm -hmm. in a new way, new mm -hmm. protocol, new kind mm -hmm. of concept. So that headroom's natural. Yeah. Uh, is there any other areas that you see as headroom? Um, that's still unexplored or just kicking the tires or just you know, scratching the surface? I think the biggest is, is mobile web performance uh, and, and tooling around that as well. As I think that's sort of the, the big um, uncharted territory right now is, is providing tooling, but also providing, um, providing hybrid mobile apps that really do feel as close to native as possible. Um, I think that in some cases there's always a, there's always a a case, there's always a time where native is going to be the best choice. A lot of, in, in a lot of gaming scenarios, native is a fantastic choice for building, for building apps. But um, HTML5 and its peers, CSS, JavaScript, are, I think, perfectly suited to solve, uh, to deliver a lot of hybrid mobile apps in this space. 
And it's not doesn't just have to be forms over data or line of business type apps. I think there's tons of scenarios where yeah. you can build but a hybrid let, app. Let's that, let's get into that because I think yeah. we we have there's a lot of different religions in around you know <laughs> uh, mobile apps, and we've seen some scar tissue. I mean, Facebook with mm. their abandonment of HTML5, mm -hmm. where they're, mm -hmm. uh, that's not their official statement, but uh, they've, they've said some things. But you got native. There's some use cases where you mm -hmm. want to go pure native. Your whole company's built on it. Right. And then you got hybrid. Then you got what I call prepackaged, whether mm -hmm. you know type apps and developing environments like a accelerator where it could be an enterprise wants mm -hmm. to throw out an accounting app and I just need to whip up right. something right or right, right. or whatever right some sort of you know framework on those use cases native hybrid prepackaged for the lack of a better description um, what are the different use cases that you see for those I mean why would someone want to do native where what does hybrid look like what are the use cases for hybrid and when do I get the turnkey you know just I need a framework blow out some apps right I think native a lot of times when it comes to the context there is a company that has the wherewithal, you know, the time, the resources, uh, the money, in, like in Facebook's case, to have separate native teams, right? There's nothing that's stopping them from doing it because yeah, they, they get have some dough too to back it up. <laughs> yeah, than than, than the rest of us have. Uh, most companies don't have that luxury to spin up yeah. three, four different native development teams, and so they have the ability to do that. And they also wanted to build a very highly customized experience. I mean, the things that Facebook has been able to do with their app since they did move back to native have been very interesting. They've done some things that are actually still quite possible with HTML5, but the skill set of that team didn't map very well to hybrid. So I think that they've, they've done better going to native because it matched the skill set of their team and they had the resources to do so. But in a lot of cases, a lot of companies are trying to get to market. You know, what they really want to have is, and I've talked to folks in the sandbox here and other attendees, and what they're really trying to do is they're trying to reach as many devices and as many customers across those devices as quickly as possible. So sometimes the hybrid might be more, okay, I got to integrate into a custom backend, I got some data protection issues, or even enterprises we hear, they want this mission critical apps that Absolutely. might be native, or Absolutely. hey, I have some, I don't want to rewrite code, just right. put a wrapper around this other app and throw right. it out there. Right, right, Absolutely. So, yeah. so that's kind of what you're saying. And right? I think that's a good use case for that. Yeah, yeah, I think so, definitely. And you know, the, on the framework side of things, when it comes to you know having industry vertical, bootstrap apps and things like that. I think there's definitely a case where that works. That works very well in the hybrid space as well. If you're, you know, a, a realty company, right? And you're just, yeah. you want to get your realty app online, you want to get there quickly, this is one of the ways that you can do it. So there's, so. A, there's some comments on Twitter I want to get your perspective okay. on. You know, okay. Nova's Twitter is Twitter. So there's a guy out there named Harold Neal, we don't know. Harold, shout out to you <laughs> if you actually watch this. Or probably not watching, but you know, if your friend's watching, tell Harold we, uh, we use this. His, his Twitter handle is Meta Creek at MetaCreek, he wrote lots of jQuery hate at Fluent Conference. He made sure he put the hashtag on there. Yeah, Not yeah. sure what he means by that. I mean, jQuery is also being discussed in the hallways here. What does he mean by that? What is, and you got another, uh, Sean uh, Kester from uh, skfox.com, skfox is his handle. You know, he says good stuff from, from Red, Red Wolves, plug for those guys on what's next for jQuery mobile. Better flexibility is always welcome, looking forward to blah, blah, blah. So, so you got one quote, says lots of hate here at Fluent Conference. Is there? Challenges going on. What does it mean by that? I think I think jQuery, because of its history, I mean, is the the most popular, the most widely used JavaScript framework in the history of the platform. So because of that popularity, there's going to be some derision sent its way, uh, and, and because of its age, it also has gone through some growing pains. Right? It's a it's a it's a middle-aged framework. So there's some aches and pains and aspects of that framework that they've that they've struggled with with uh, with dealing with. But at the same time, jQuery has done a fantastic job of managing. Uh, moving the web forward in terms of dropping IE 6, 7, and 8 support. And so they now have an option where you can get a much smaller jQuery because a lot of the cross-browser stuff that they had to do for IE 6 through 8 has been removed from the library. So you can you can still support those browsers. You can still get a version of jQuery that, that, that leverages that if you want, but you can also get a smaller version as well. And they've done a good job of, of really managing the growth of that library and, and responding to where things are going in the industry. But I think some of the derision there as well comes from the fact that because jQuery's been around for so long, because it's so popular, because it's so widely used, there are aspects of that API that are inconsistent, there are aspects that sometimes are difficult to use, uh, and like any large popular library, people notice these things and form yeah. a negative it, opinion yeah. about yeah. it. Stuff breaks. <laughs> Stuff breaks, absolutely. And I, and I, you know, I did no. a talk yesterday morning and actually used jQuery as an example of good API design and bad API design in the same way. Well, this is the so. classic struggle in a growth market, right? So you get JavaScript and jQuery, you know, both have legacy and history mm -hmm. and that are positive, right? right. And then, you know, the, the growing pains are, you know, we're modernizing a new era, right? right. So right. there's some things that need to be tweaked. Right. 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 So, you know, getting people to cobble together Standards is probably a lot of arguments. Right. It's probably a lot of right, <laughs> contention. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, I love this feature, but you have to look at the bigger picture. Right, right, right. And I, I think as 
you know, jQuery is one of the first. And, you know, there, when jQuery came around, there were a handful of JavaScript-based libraries. Now we have thousands of JavaScript-based libraries. I think I saw from Ignite Fluent the other night, one of the speakers made the comment about how there are five new JavaScript libraries released every day. Wow. Five brand new open source JavaScript libraries every day. Every day. And uh, they're not all going to be good. Uh, but as there's as there, as there are more of those out in the wild, people are learning better practices. They're learning different ways of doing things, and they're taking an eye back to jQuery, sort of the old man in the room when it comes to JavaScript libraries, and saying, "Wow, he." Some people think it hasn't aged quite quite that well, but in many cases it has. And, the, yeah. and they have a very active team and a vibrant community and a great foundation. They continue to do amazing work. And so, tell us about your company, Telerix. So uh -huh. Let's put a plug in for what you guys are doing. What is what is the company? What are you guys okay. uh, up to? And your role there. So Telerix is a developer tools vendor. We've been around for about ten years. Uh, most of our history, we have built uh, tools for uh, developers on the Microsoft stack. So everything from uh, from ASP.NET AJAX controls to Windows Phone controls to Silverlight controls. And the, the team that I work on is our cross-platform tools and services division. And I work as the program management lead for that division. And there's a couple of different products that uh, are, are really our key pieces of what we have inside of there. And one is Kendo UI, which is a framework for building rich web and hybrid mobile applications with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And another product is Icinium. And Icinium is actually a cloud-based IDE for building uh, hybrid apps for iOS and Android, and it's a uh, both a native desktop app on uh, Windows, but also a browser-based IDE uh, on all of the other platforms. And you can actually build your app using either Kendo UI Mobile or jQuery Mobile, and then uh, test your app in the browser, test your app on the device, and then we provide all of the packaging to actually package up your app for iOS and Android and deploy it into the App Store. So one of the great advantages is if you're a Windows user, you can actually build iOS apps without having to buy a Mac. All so, the way to deployment into the apps. Usually it's the so one of, so yeah, right. I got I got to ask you about obviously a topic that's always delicate with front end guys because it's really it's, and more of an issue on the enterprise side. And that's security, right? Mm. So content security policy is really important. Um, John Berghoff just tweeted uh, 30 seconds ago. It's the only security session at Fluent Conference on content security. But not many people are here. Um, Bluehost cares about security. Obviously, we're probably worse for Bluehost, but you know, security is an issue, right? I mean, mm -hmm. how does that factor in? Is that kind of down the road? Is it a do-over? Um, I mean, how do you look at that piece? It's, just, it's not really on the radar. So, oh, that's a great question. And actually, in, in terms of content security policy, one of my teammates is doing a talk on uh, Chrome package apps in about 20 minutes, and he will talk about content security <laughs> policy. And CSP is definitely What's one of his those name? His name is Burke Collins. Yeah, and he'll be actually doing a talk right here in Continental Ballroom 4, actually. Uh, well, we should get him on to, uh, to on the cube. Yeah, 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 yeah Come on and address the, to have him talk about Well, there's a big issue, right? It's one of those yeah. things where it's like you don't you have to address it. You kind of check the box, but this is philosophy involved, right? You have a lot of I/O going on to the it, server side. That's yeah. where the data is. Absolutely, and, and we get that. I mean, that, that comes in if you're if you're if you're using Kendo UI Mobile to build an app and you're targeting the browsers. Obviously, you have the same security considerations that you do for building any other kind of web app. But you have a similar consideration if you're packaged that packaging that app up with Cordova and submitting it into the app stores. And it's really a matter of uh, as a as a dev tools company, one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to is anything that we can do to make that tooling story, especially on mobile, better for a developer to where it is turnkey out of the box. They don't have to worry about those types of things. Uh, we want to build it into the platform. We want to build it into the framework. And there's things around security that we have upcoming. You know, things that we're working on, kind of behind the scenes. Uh, but by and large, um, that's something that. Uh, is, has always been at the forefront of what we're doing on the mobile space and in the web space as well. So I've got to ask you about Microsoft. Obviously Microsoft's big presence in the enterprise. What do you tell the folks out there that are in the enterprise side? Because a lot of mobile, big, mm -hmm. bring your own device to work. Again, some security issues, kind of, we don't want to talk about that now, but like enterprise clients, they need to have mobile apps. Everyone who has an iPad, we've been hearing this for now two years, mm -hmm. make this work on the mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. And so you're starting to see that migration. You've done some things, now it's more, okay, I want to roll out BYOD, bring your own device to work, and I got to get everything to work on that. So what's your advice to enterprises when they come to you and say, hey, I want to quickly turn up some mobile yeah. apps to drive my business? Yeah. I think this is really a sweet spot for us for Kendo UI Mobile. Uh, so Kendo UI Mobile is a, is a key piece of Kendo UI. We have Kendo UI Web. Uh, data viz for data, you know, SVG based charts and graphs and visualizations, and then Kendo UI Mobile. And Kendo UI Mobile 
is an adaptive rendering framework that actually gives you a native look and feel on iOS, Android, Windows Phone, and BlackBerry devices. And so it's really a matter of writing one set of markup, one set of HTML, one set of JavaScript, and then our framework will detect the device and render something that looks like an iOS app on an iPhone or an iPad. It looks like an Android app on an Android. And so when you're in that environment of you know bring your own device, what you're doing is you're building an app for your customers that is it is one code base that your dev team has to maintain, but something that feels more comfortable to all of your users, even in the enterprise, because it feels like their other Android apps. And the rapid development like too, right? You, and, you, and, you, and you can, and you can go fast. fast. And this is one of those areas where it's not, you know, you don't have to worry about having four dev teams because you're not Facebook and you don't have a billion dollars lying around. Or they might want to go native on maybe one or two apps, not 20. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Right. right, exactly. So they can they can pick and choose. And there's a lot of internal apps where this is a great And that's solution. the Kendo UI? Ken, that's that's Kendo UI, yeah. Yep. So Kendo UI Mobile is that. Is that, that and what's the website? Stack. It's actually kendoui.com. Kendo, K-E-N-D-O. K-E-N-D-O, yeah, UI.com. Great, okay, yeah. check that out. Um, we're here at the Fluent Conference. This is uh, Silicon Angle's The Cube. We go out to the events, extract the ceiling from the noise. Go to siliconangle.com and you'll see the uh, blog post about this event. Also go to O'Reilly Media. They have great content on their site. They're also live streaming. And if you want to see the videos uh, after all the missed some interviews, go to youtube.com slash siliconangle and you'll see all the videos up there. Uh, my final question for you is, as you peruse the, you know, the event here and mm -hmm. you're out in, uh, and, you know, pioneering and plowing the fields of the future, uh, what, are the, what are the things that are going to, what shoes are going to drop in the next five years? Obviously, this is explosive. There's no doubt about it. JavaScript's going to be around. You talked about jQuery and other things. The, the, it's going to mature pretty fast. Um, yeah. What are the, some of the things you see happening in the next five years for developers that they should be watching, concerned about participating in? Mm. I think the biggest is to pay attention to the fact that the web is continuing to propagate everywhere. We talked a little bit about JavaScript being on the server and in the database, uh, but there's also this trend of the web making its way onto platforms. Windows 8 is a great example of this. Windows 8 is the only platform where you can build a JavaScript-based app and a C-sharp-based app, and they look, they look identical to, to an end user, and that's actually a full-on platform app. What, what Mozilla is doing with Firefox OS is the same thing. With Firefox OS, you actually now have basically the web browser as the operating system. Chrome's doing the same thing with Chrome OS. And so I think that's the biggest thing for developers to pay attention to is that web, the open web is not about the web browser anymore. It's about all devices. I asked Sergey Brin when he launched Chrome, is it an operating system? He had a twinkle in his eye. This was in 2008. <laughs> um, so, yeah. again, it, it, we, we make the right predictions here at SiliconANGLE. But, you know, this was pretty obvious. I mean, right. Android was right around the corner. Right. You could just connect the dots. Yeah. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to say, hey, the, you know, you got to go native in the browser. The web is a platform. Yes. That's yeah. it. Yeah. For yeah. all devices. Yeah, and I think this is changing the game. You mentioned Windows 8. I mean, Microsoft's monopoly was based mm -hmm. upon, you know, having an operating system and apps that run on top of it. Right. You take that operating system away and distribute it with open source you now have an interesting market dynamic. Right, right. That, That's playing a lot into this, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah, 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 very much so. <laughs> and and it, losing a little bit of that stronghold has actually um, caused them to innovate a bit more. Uh, it's great, I mean, you get, you get yeah. your backs up against the wall and you feel like you have to yeah. go do some new things. That, People that start, benefits developers. Yeah, I mean, see, I think Microsoft, I mean, my assessment of Microsoft following them since, the, you know, they, since I was a you know, first generation in the industry with them is that, you know, they start getting their breakfast eaten and now a little bit of their lunch and they, they realize that at this path, you know, open source is going to eat their lunch and then ultimately their dinner. So I think they're pretty stoked that they have to move quickly. Absolutely, and I've been impressed with the work that they've done. They, there's, you've seen a lot more Microsoft Teams making their way into GitHub, contributing in communities, getting involved in Node.js. The things that they've been adding to Azure for, for non-Windows-based operating, you know, you can yeah. run a Linux box yeah. in Azure yeah. now. And five years ago, that would have been unthinkable. Brandon Satstrom, guru, done a lot of JavaScript uh, on the platform side. You know, great, great discussion about your, your Microsoft uh, work you've done and also in the standards as well. Microsoft, you know, don't let the market eat your lunch and dinner. Um, <laughs> keep up the good work. We're looking forward to seeing more success there and, uh, and on the open source side as well. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. This is uh, theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest. I'm John Furrier from SiliconANGLE. I'm with Jeff Frick, and we'll be right back with our next guest after the short break.